workshop is built around the theme of climate and the unfortunate direction it is currently moving. Uh, we have two interesting talks lined up and please everyone uh, do ask questions and comment using the Q&A on Zoom throughout the whole session. Uh, before we give the floor to the first speaker, I will show you a couple of slides showing the results, some of the results from our climate questionnaire. One moment. No. <laughs> Present. Yeah. Sorry. So we asked a couple of questions from all our, our registered uh, attendees on uh, their ideas and feelings on the climate and the climate crisis. And uh, as we can see here from the first slide, the ma majority of the people who answered on the questionnaire do seem to be uh, rather concerned about the climate crisis. Uh, there are, of course, always some naysayers, but uh, we can live with them, I suppose. Uh, majority of the uh, people who answered the questionnaire told that they are environmentally conscious in their everyday life. But when asking the question whether this is true also for the lab that they are working, the answers are pretty much uh, more varied. And... Uh, <sighs> Most of the things that labs seem to be doing, at, at least based on the uh, results here, uh, are to follow proper disposal procedures, uh, sharing resources, avoiding excessive flying and switching to more sustainable chemicals. So there is some work being done for the sustainable research as well, but I suppose there is still much more to be done. I stop sharing the screen now and give floor to Annika for the introductions. Yes, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. It's uh, Dr. Kate Jeffrey. Kate Jeffrey is a behavioral neuroscientist at the University College London. Her scientific research explores how the brain makes an internal map of space for use in navigation and memory. At UCL, she heads the Institute of Behavioral Neuroscience in the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences and is the Vice Dean for the Faculty of Brain Sciences. She is also co-director of the electrophysiology company Axona, which makes high-density recording systems for behavioral neuroscientists. Um, she is interested in enhancing, enhancing public understanding of science and in its role has given many talks, not only about her research, but also about the climate crisis. Thank you for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours, Dr. Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Um, I will just share my screen. I hope you can all see that. So, um, yeah, so I'm a neuroscientist, nothing uh, to do with climate um, change research whatsoever. But like many people, I started to get very concerned about the climate crisis a couple of years ago. In fact, it's, it's been something I've been aware of for a long time. Um, and I went through some of the psychological processes in my own mind that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, but really, in, in 2019, I think there was a widespread awakening as to the severity and the speed of this crisis and I became um, quite involved with uh, with some um, sort of activism uh, but also as a scientist thinking about what we can be doing as scientists and so I want to um, tell you a little bit about the conclusions that I've kind of come to from from looking into aspects of the psychology of the crisis so I'm sort of a psychologist <laughs> I study rats most of the time but I do think about humans as well and I think this is a this is a crisis of human psychology. We are not going to solve it with technology. We're going to solve it by understanding human psychology. So that makes human psychology the most important scientific discipline that we have right now. So what I want to do is to um, quickly review the climate science, although I, I think this audience is probably pretty familiar with it, um, and then talk about what I think are the psychological issues that we need to grapple with if we are to have any chance of of preventing a calamitous change um, in our in our planet so i'm sure you have seen this graph many times this is 
there, there are lots and lots of variants of this that are out there now but basically this is just showing the strongly parallel change in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels measured in parts per million and changes in the global temperature um, in this this happens to be in degrees celsius but you can see that there's a, a very very close match and you can also see that the rise is exponential and we know from our recent brush with another exponential process which is the um, COVID spread um, exponential spread across the planet we know how quickly an exponential change can go from yeah something's happening but we're not sure if we should worry to oh my gosh this is a complete calamity we should have acted long ago so that seems to be the path that we're on and that's what climate scientists are telling us so so the um the background to this is kind of interesting if you look at the temperature of the earth and if you are sort of scientifically minded which i think you all are uh, we, we tend to think of something like climate as very stable because in our own experience it's been stable it's not really changed much but if you look over the history of the earth actually climate shows all of the signs of being um, a very unstable phenomenon so it's not like a biological system where there's homeostasis and if you um, push that system away from the baseline it will try to recover so that's the kind of system that many of us are used to thinking about uh, planet earth's temperature uh, has oscillated wildly in its history so this graph is the last 500 million years it's the scale changes across the bottom so it goes from you know hundreds of millions of years to tens of millions of years to millions and so on and so on but you can see that it has undergone un undergone these big fluctuations this is um, the last million years and in the last million years which is when humans had evolved and and were still evolving um, we went in and out of ice ages um, and then you can see that there was this strange change in the um, the climate in the last 12,000 years where it became extremely stable and this is called the holocene um, climate optimum and that is the period of time over which we have developed civilization so that's when we began agriculture and um, civilization so the ice ages stopped we've had a nice stable climate that's enabled us to grow crops and all of that kind of stuff. Now we are um, in the process of, sorry, I'm just going to hide this panel. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's in my way. Okay, there we go. Um, so if you look at what's happening here, this is just the last uh, 200 years, and this is where we're projected to be by 2050, which is you know three decades away, and this is where we're projected to be by the end of the century. Celsius scale is on this side, by the way. Um, and you can see that by 2050, we're going to be at a temperature that we haven't seen for the last um, 130,000 years. And by the end of the century, we're going to be um, at a place that we haven't seen for several million years, according to some projections. It varies, um, but the, the upper, upper bound of the current projections from the, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, put us at four degrees. Um, and in fact, the predictions of that body in the past have been conservative, so the upper bound is not unreasonable. So that's a big change. The other exponential is that our emissions are increasing. And despite all of the uh, work that we've been doing since the 1980s, when this problem first became apparent, um, they have not even budged. The exponential continues upwards. So we've tried hard to reduce our emissions, but we're not succeeding. If you zoom in on the um, last 2000 years, so the end of the Holocene, you can see uh, that most of this change has happened since the industrial age began. And the reason is that although we had been increasing atmospheric CO2 for the 12,000 years since agriculture began, and that's why we've had a Holocene and haven't had an ice age, uh, the fact is since we started using fossil fuels to power our industry, we um, produced a massive change. The other side of the coin is that it's not just climate, it's also the general ecological destruction that we have undertaken to support our burgeoning population. So we've deforested most of the planet now and turned it over to agriculture. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time too. So it's not just modern technological civilization that's caused these problems. There are ancient civilizations uh, that also destroyed their environments. So the Easter Islanders, turned their island from something that was forested 
to something that was completely grassland and was unable to sustain that population and it, and it died out. Australia also used to be forested and when humans arrived about 50,000 years ago, there's evidence of, of widespread, you know, continent-wide uh, burning of the forests that were there and now most of the interior of that continent is, is desert, so um, desert and very low scrub like this and doesn't really support much in the way of uh, food production for humans. And there's also been a massive collapse in biodiversity. And indeed, a lot of the megafauna, so the large vertebrates that used to roam the planet, have died out. And some people think that that dying out uh, coincides pretty strongly with the arrival of humans onto those continents. So, so we don't have a great track record. Um, and that leads us to sort of be a little bit pessimistic about our current situation. But um, I want to talk about kind of what um, what, what the kind of options are looking like they might be. So why haven't we really done anything? We seem to be kind of ignoring the problem. And how do we mobilize the human race to take action so that we can protect the planet and make, you know, keep it habitable for future humans, which most of us would like to do. So I think we need to look at this problem through the lens of evolutionary psychology, rather than the um, the lens of thinking of humans as uh, logical processes. So as we've learned a bit about human psychology in the last 150 years or so, we've, um, we've learned that, that despite what we like to think, we're not really particularly logical. Our beliefs and our actions, we believe that they're driven by logic. And so, and we interpret our actions post hoc through the lens of logic. So when somebody says, why did you do that? You come up with a logical reason. Well, that person said so and so, and you know, and that made me realize that blah blah blah. And so we we use logic as a framework to explain our actions, but it, it's really not what drives our actions. Um, and the same is true of our beliefs. And so there's a lot of work that's been done in the last few decades showing that how we construct our beliefs and our um, you know actions is is motivated by what they call heuristics. So they're kind of shortcuts that are hardwired into um, into our brains. So what aspects um, of human psychology should we consider? So I'm just um, the first thing is, what does it take to make people believe and accept that the climate really is changing? And this has been a surprisingly big hurdle that we've needed to overcome. The second thing is, if they accept it, what, what does that do to their emotional state? And then the third thing is what prevents them um, having, having achieved that acceptance from taking action. And by them, I mean all of us um, as individuals and as collectives. And then finally, how why might we kind of overcome these barriers? So the first, first thing to touch on is what makes people believe that this is happening in the first place. And one of the things that we have realized is that our processing of risk is, is really not very, very good. And it's not very much tied to the statistics of the risk. It's much more tied to our personal experience and to our ability to imagine a risk. So we're much more frightened of things that we can imagine than things that are kind of hard to imagine. The climate changing is quite hard to imagine. Whereas um, some type of, of attack, um, for example, the Twin Towers attack, which was a very salient experience for the people who were um, around at the time that that happened. That was a that was a, an event that transformed global geopolitics. It had an enormous effect on the psychology of people, and yet it only killed about um, three thousand people. There was a climate event in uh, a couple of years later in two thousand and three that swept across Europe, big heat, heat wave, that was estimated afterwards to have killed about 30,000 people, um, all told. And yet it barely made a, a ripple on people's consciousnesses. Some people remember, yeah, that was a hot summer. But the scale and magnitude of the disaster was not at all appreciated by the people who lived through it. And of course, we have a much more recent example of that, the COVID pandemic, which has killed um, millions worldwide. You know, and, and within um, each of our own countries, likely on the order of hundreds of thousands. So that these are huge disasters, many, many times the magnitude of the Twin Towers disaster. And yet our response 
to that has been quite lukewarm. It's, we've been it's been difficult to get people to isolate or to wear masks or to get vaccinated or all of the things that could stop the death. We don't really uh, react. So again, that's because it's, it's very hard to image um, millions of people dying. You know, if a, if a neighbor dies or a friend or a relative, then we have a psychological understanding of what this means. But, but for the majority of people in the COVID ep epidemic, despite the death toll, a lot of people don't even know uh, anybody uh, um, who died from it. Um, and so it remains a kind of a theoretical risk, and we're not very good with theoretical risks. And there's a whole huge re research endeavor trying to get at how do we get people to um, process risk for insurance purposes, for example, and, and it's not very easy. The other um, thing that we now know is that pe people's beliefs are not really explainable by what they know, um, despite what we like to think. And because we're all scientists, in fact, um, this is possibly less true than it is for most people, because we are trained to take on board facts and to kind of push aside our, our um, you know, inclinations and to focus on the facts. And even then, we're not very good about it. So, you know, science, science works by um, huge numbers of scientists coming to a consensus about something, because any one of us as individual scientists are, are completely biased by you know, what we want to believe. We, we, we want to believe that our own research is better than anyone else's and that our results are therefore more true than anyone else's and all the rest of it. So even as scientists, we're not very good at processing facts. Um, and people who aren't trained in this are even less so. And this can be very difficult for a scientifically trained person because when you meet a climate denier or a COVID denier or, or whatever else, your instinct is to educate that person and to give facts to them. Look, there's this graph and there's this um, numbers and how do you explain this? And how do you explain that? And you know, if you were right, then blah, and, and, and so on and so on. So we try and use logic and we try and use um, facts and information and all of the things that we're comfortable with. Um, we, we're trying to fill their brains with information. And, and that presupposes that the um, thing that's driving their beliefs is information deficit, what they call the deficit model of people's beliefs. But we now know that that's not really why people believe things and therefore filling them with information is not going to change their beliefs. And in fact, it will often make them put up barriers. So if you start berating somebody about not getting vaccinated or not wearing a mask or whatever, um, the, the likelihood is that you're just gonna create an, an added distance between you and that person and have the opposite effect from the one that, that you intend. So what does drive people's beliefs? So largely, um, so a, a lot, well, I don't know if it's largely, but a lot of what drives our beliefs is what the people in our uh, in-group, so the people in our social network believe. And a really good example of this is this very famous study that was done a few years ago, which has been replicated many times in different countries now, looking at the um, pre the prevalence of people who accept climate change or reject it based on their political affiliations, whether they're uh, Democrat or Republican. And you can see that there's, um, there's a difference between Democrats and Republicans. So Democrats are more likely to believe in climate change and Republicans less so. And not only that, but that deficit has widened over the intervening years. So despite all of the extra information that's come along, the gap has widened. And the, the same is true um, in, in many countries. So people who are on the more liberal uh, end of the political spectrum are more likely to believe that climate change is happening, A, A that it's happening, and B, that it's caused by human activity. Uh, and people who are at the more conservative end of it are more likely to believe that either it's not happening or if it is happening, it, it's not caused by us. It, it's a kind of a natural change. So this kind of, is kind of tapping into something that's very important in human psychology, which is that we, we absorb a lot of our beliefs from our, our kind of trusted circle. And that's what they call an heuristic, which is a shortcut to establishing your mental framework for action. And it, it has um, evolutionary adaptive sense, because if your brain said you need, you need to process every piece of information, um, and, and, and research its origins before you believe it, we'd spend our whole entire time doing research. And of course, you know, meanwhile, our competitors would be off doing you know, whatever they need to do to survive. 
So, you know, evolution has said, look, the logical thing to believe is what the people around you believe because they're healthy and they're thriving and you're in their network. So you may as well believe what they, what they believe as, as a starting point. And then maybe you might need to change that, but it's going to take a lot of evidence to make you change that and maybe you never will. So our starting point is to believe what the people in our trusted networks are believing. And the problem with globalization is that we've created a lot of sub networks that aren't really talking to each other. So for example, we're seeing a lot of political polarization in the US right now. And that's one of the reasons it's having the biggest uh, vaccination problem because COVID acceptance has become attached to these social groups and these social groups are not talking to each other at the moment. So that's something we need to bear in mind if we're going to try and overcome people's climate denial. Um, risk perception is also somewhat socially determined. So there's quite a famous effect called the white male effect, which is if you ask people from different demographic groups, such as white males, non-white males, white females and non-white females, um, ask them to assess a whole bunch of different risks, then the, the white males are much lower on the risk spectrum than all of the other groups. Um, there's climate change down there, by the way, which is quite low in the um, hierarchy of risks, of perceived risks. Um, so, so again, the, the, uh, our acceptance of risks is um, very much a function of the demographic group that we're in. If we manage to overcome these, and I think there's some evidence now that we are starting to overcome climate denial. So if you poll the number of people who, who believe in climate change, it, it is increasing, um, but we've still got a long way to go. But once people have accepted it, then, then what happens? So we get a, a bunch of emotional reactions. And if you've talked to people, you've probably encountered all of these at one time or another. So it's, it's a hoax. Um, you know, it's it's big government trying to get control of the population. They're scaremongering. Maybe the climate's changing, but it's not nearly as bad as people are saying. If you look at the um, past temperatures of the Earth, you know, it's been warm before. It's, it's, it's no big deal. Um, we've got plenty of time. So, yes, the climate's changing, but, you know, it's not changing that fast. And, and technology is, is on the case. Um, we've got, you know, movement now, governments have formed the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the IPCC, and we've got the Paris Agreement. And so things are starting to happen. So we'll be fine. Um, there's all these new technologies coming along now. We've got carbon capture you know, devices and, and all of this kind of stuff. We've got, you know, um, electric vehicles are coming along and, you know, so technology will fix it. Uh, we live a long way from the equator. So climate change would be quite good for us, you know, because we live in, in a country that's actually quite cold, it would be quite nice if it got a little bit warmer and so on. So you often see uh, these types of comment in social media or in, in people you talk to. And these are all forms of denial. And, and one of the um, kind of one of the kind of reasons for denial is to protect ourselves from information that that is making us feel helpless um, and also frightened. So one of the problems with presenting climate change as an existential threat, which of course it, it is, but if you present it that way, um, then, then people are, are, are kind of frightened. And if you're presented with a threat that's, that's, that you're unable to deal with because it's outside of your control, then one of the heuristics that we've evolved, the shortcuts, is to pretend that it's not happening so that we will still get on and do the things that we can do, which um, we need to do to stay alive, go to work, earn our money, till the crops or whatever it is that we need to do to feed our families and so on. So denial is a protective instinct that, that stops us from confronting um, existential threats that we can't do anything about. So while it is protective, it's also one of the barriers to change. So, you know, there are all of these, um, these, these other emotions, even once you've got past denial, fear, grief, and anger are, are very, very common. And one of, the, one of the ways that climate activists are trying to, to motivate action on climate change is to tap into these. So, so um, Greta Thunberg, for example, um, will, will often say, you know, that her, her kind of message is, I want you to panic. 
Um, I don't want you to deny this. I don't want you to feel hope. Um, I want you to feel fear and panic. I want you to act. It's as if the house is on fire. And um, there's been a lot of value in this kind of messaging because um, it can be very motivating and it has motivated a lot of activism, including the, um, the activis activism that I've been involved in with um, an organization called Extinction Rebellion, which um, sprung up in, in 2019 and, um, and really kind of tapped into this um, kind of fear, grief and anger kind of emotion. But this kind of emotion, um, this kind of messaging can be, can be actually counterproductive because while it can be motivating to some people, it can be uh, demotivating to other people. It induces a kind of fatalism and a despair um, and actually stops them from taking action and is more likely to induce denial. So this brings us to barriers to action. What are the barriers to um, climate action? So one of them is this feeling of helplessness. And this is related to something that's been studied in psychology quite a lot in the past, which is learned helplessness, which is a um, which is a behavioral inactivity that that happens when an animal is subjected to a very stressful experience that it has no control over. Um, and there were old experiments, which we don't do anymore now for ethical reasons, but old experiments were where um, animals were for example, placed in a, in a tank of water and um, allowed to swim to the point of complete and utter exhaustion where um, they didn't think that they could get out. And these animals, um, if, they, um, if they are not given the opportunity to believe they can get out, they go into the state of what's called learned helplessness. They don't think there's any point trying to escape. And if subsequently they're placed in that same situation, they have learned not to even try to escape and they will kind of helplessly sink to the bottom and so on and so on. Um, so learned helplessness is a, is a kind of a, a, learned, um, a learned inaction. Um, and it comes in humans from this sense that there's no, there's no point trying to do anything because nothing will be effective. And there's a, there's a kind of a, learned, a cultural learned helplessness with climate change at the moment because of the fact that we've looked, we've known about it now for many decades and we have tried to do things we've tried to decarbonize um we have had multiple climate summits and all the rest of it, and, and nothing has really happened and um so a lot of people are, are just thinking well you know th there's no point even trying so this is kind of fatalism the other the other problem and i, I think this is um this is a really tricky one and that is, there's, um, there's a, an instinct that is woven into all of us to prioritize our own needs. And this is most famously captured by this scenario um, from a discipline in psychology called game theory called the tragedy of the commons. And this is, um, this takes its name from this paper that was written by um, a theorist called Garrett Hardin and, and published in Science in 1968. And he was outlining the, the kind of the calculations that um, come into play when people are weighing up whether to take collective action on something or not. So the scenario was, imagine you have a village and a bunch of goat herds who all want to, or sheep herds, I think, in, in his original paper, they all want to graze their animals on the village common. And the village common is becoming degraded as a result so they've all put their goats on there and it's the grass is being eaten faster than it can regrow and it's starting to get bare patches in it and it's quite clear that it's going to turn into a dust bowl and then all of the animals will die and so the goat herds all get together and they they all agree that they need to stop adding more animals that the, they've reached as many as they can sustain um, and they need to stop at that point um, and it's each, each um, family just has to make do with you know as many goats as they have now from the point of view of the collective that makes complete sense because if they all restrain their goats to just the number that they have then the common grassland will survive and everybody will thrive and prosper and so on and so on but from the point of view of the individual the goat herd is sitting there going 
you know, we've just had another baby. We, we don't have quite enough to eat. We need another goat. Um, I know that we collectively agreed not to put any more animals uh, on the common, but it's quite a big common. And one more animal won't really make much difference to everybody because the effect of that extra animal is going to be distributed. But it'll make a big difference to my family. So I'm going to add another animal. And of course, every goat herd makes that same calculation that when you when you weigh up the pluses and minuses of action, the cost benefit calculation comes out in favor of adding another goat because the cost is distributed and the benefit accrues only to you. And so the logical, rational thing to do is to add more goats. And this is a, a really big problem and, and it's come to be called the tragedy of the commons because of course everybody does that. They're all acting according to logic, um, but the consequence is that the commons collapses and all the animals die. Now, of course, you know, the climate crisis is a, um, a tragedy of the commons scenario. And when I talk to people, I will very often get um, something along the lines of this comment, what about China? So you can say to people, in England, where I am, we need to decarbonize the economy. And they go, what's the point? Because we're a small country. What about China, big country? You know, I imagine in China, they have conversations along the lines of, well, what about Australia? What about the US? What about Europe? You know, we're all in this sort of same situation of we need energy. We have populations that are growing. Uh, we need to sustain our economy. It makes rational sense for us to do what we need to, to get more energy. The UK has just, the government has just granted permission to for another coal mine in, in Wales. The Australian government has just announced it's going to mine more coal. China is building more power stations. Um, you know, all over the world, people are um, drilling for oil, mining coal, um, burning fossil fuels. We're all doing it. And it's the tragedy of the commons. And the problem is that logically, it's the rational thing to do for an individual country, but it's also collectively irrational. Um, so, you know, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, it's possible to get really angry with one's own government or other governments. But the fact is, um, they, there, there is a logical conundrum and we can't, we can't get around that. So how do we overcome the barriers to, to action? So I think we need to look at ourselves, as I said at the beginning, through the lens of evolutionary psychology. We need to, for, for a start, not to be angry at individuals or at governments who are acting in a climate unfriendly way. That, that doesn't help. It, it doesn't help to point the finger. We are all acting according to the products of our you know, evolved genes. And our um, genetic evolution has said you need to prioritize your own well-being. That just makes sense. It's, it's been stable for us. The other possible scenarios where we evolved to be perfectly altruistic, there's a lot of evolutionary theory that shows that that's not a stable situation. We couldn't have evolved perfectly altruistic genes where we, where we all act for the collective. There's no point even wishing that we had those and, because we haven't and, and we couldn't have them. So we need to use our intelligence to get around that instead. But there are, there are some positives to the way that we're genetically configured. So we are actually, um, despite the kind of selfishness and the fact that we have the you know, tragedy of the common genes and all the rest of it, we are actually the most cooperative animal that's ever evolved. So most social species that are out there, like you know, bees and wasps and ants and, and these other animals that work in collectives so where the individual works for the greater good and, and individuals will sacrifice themselves and so on. Um, the vast majority of those species are genetically related in their cooperative collectives. Um, for example, bees are more or less, most of the bees in the hive are siblings. And so when they sacrifice themselves for the hive, they're sacrificing themselves to protect their own genes, if you like. Whereas we humans are not genetically related to, to strangers. Um, you know, we're, we're randomly related to, to strangers. And yet there's a lot of cooperative action, including altruism. 
where we will work for the collective good. So I'm giving up my time to talk to you. You're giving up your time to listen to me. None of us are getting paid for this. We're doing this because we want humanity um, to benefit a generation from now. We're not, we're not personally benefiting from this time, but we are cooperating. And one of the reasons that we've evolved this, these cooperative instincts, I think, is that we evolved language, which is something really unique in uh, the evolution of life on Earth. And through language, we've been able to um, we've been able to make it so that when we cooperate, we ourselves do benefit. So, for example, we can say things like, "If you give me one of your chickens." Um, I'll give you some of my corn and, and you know, because you've got too many chickens and I've got too much corn and, and we, you know, so, so we've been able to do this, not just um, to our tribes people in the same village, but to people in countries on the other side of the planet, you know, I can go onto eBay and I can sell something to somebody in America. Um, and we no longer directly trade in goods, we trade in these intermediary things like, like um, currency including these days cryptocurrency, which is a whole new thing. But it's all based on this idea that we've been able to rationally cooperate. Um, and we've been able to make that work because individuals benefit from the collective cooperation. So I think that's the ultimate key to solving the climate crisis. I think if there's any solution to be had, it has to involve individuals gaining directly, not, not in some theoretical far off future, but individuals gaining directly from the transaction. So for example, the goat herds and the tragedy of the commons can solve that problem by saying, look, instead of just um, trying to tr trying to negotiate this agreement for some theoretical benefit far off in the future, why don't we set up some kind of currency trading thing where if you want to put another goat on, you have to pay us and all this kind of, kind of stuff and so on and so on. So you can turn this theoretical far off benefit into an immediate gain. And I think we have to do something like that. So whether it's um, carbon trading or carbon credits or um, something, I think we need to somehow, um, you know, use our collective cooperative intelligence for um, collective individual benefit, if you like. So, um, we need to work with the tragedy of the commons logic and not against it. Um, people will also make sacrifices for the common good if they believe that there's reciprocity. So people, people will act altruistically like we are now, even if they're not immediately benefiting now, if they believe that other people are going to do that too. And I think one of the hopes that comes out of some of these governmental um, Kind of um, collective actions like the COP26, you know, meeting and the, you know, the um, the things like the climate treaties that we've gotten together and so on. I think um, at a government mental level, we can get cooperation if if there's this really clear sense of reciprocity. So each government is kind of like an individual in the way they're processing logic, and they will say, okay, look, I'm willing to do this, but I need to get something out of it. So I'm willing to not build another power station but I need to get something back for that. So it's not enough to just have governments say, okay, we're gonna give up something. They need to feel they're getting a return on it. So we, so we need to put that together. We need, um, we need governments to act and we need people to act. So when governments act, they can, they can kind of elicit individual action by, by force, if you like, by making laws, <laughs> but they'll only do that if um, if they're supported by people, certainly in a democracy, you know, in a non-completely uh, authoritarian state, they need to have the, the backing of people for people to accept the top-down control. So we need to get people to buy into this as well. So governments buying into this from the top and people buying into this from the bottom. So what, what can we do as individuals then to make this happen? Well, one thing that we can do is change our own lifestyles. Now, we all know that that's not going to make any difference. It's like withholding your goat from the, the commons, you know. Um, it's not going to affect the outcome in and of itself. But because we are a social species, we kind of look at each other, especially the people in our networks, and, and we imitate them and copy them. So if your neighbours put solar panels on their roof, you're a little bit likely to think, hmm, maybe we should do that too. 
if you give up your petrol car and switch to an electric car, maybe the neighbor on the other side might think, hmm, I might do that too. So you can change your own lifestyle and it has an infinitesimal effect in one way, but it's part of what we hope will be a social contagion effect. And also it makes you feel better, which is something important. A really important thing is to talk to people. And I've started doing this a lot now. So I'm talking to you. I, I talk to people every chance I get. At, you know, whenever we have a committee meeting, um, I will try and insert a little comment about sustainability in there somewhere about the environment, you know, um, is what we're proposing as a way we can make that a little bit more environmentally friendly or less destructive or whatever. Um, after I joined Extinction Rebellion, I was asked to give a lot of talks to the general public about the climate crisis, and I gave lots and lots of talks. And having given talks, I then got invited by people in those talks to give other talks and so on. Um, as academics, we give a lot of talks, and so we're quite used to it, and it's, it's something that we can do. And the more we talk about it, the more it becomes a collective action. Very important to talk to politicians, because I said, as I said, Although we need the kind of bottom up movements, we also need the top down. And as you go on in your scientific career, you start to have more and more engagement with politicians in things like select committees or um, just, you know, getting getting known um, in, in more high level decision making circles and so on. Um, but also just writing to your local government representative um, because they do listen to the electorate. They want to get voted in, and the more people you can get communicating with your local representatives, the more effect they will be able to have in, um, in government. Um, so lobby government, use your professional influence wherever possible. Um, so for example, if you are on committees, see if you can initiate a sustainability initiative in your own university. And having done that, publicize that to your um, Kind of peers and other universities and try and spread that through the network and you know think about protesting so it has quite an impact when academics who are normally quite reserved and reticent start picketing or you know marching in the streets or um maybe even more extreme things gluing themselves to buildings i've, I've never done that but you know things really quite quite eye-catching things because once once we come down out of our ivory towers that you know that really makes an impression on the general public even scientists who normally are just doing research even they are out on the street saying we have to change so it must be really bad we really need to do something so there is um there is a part for protests to play as well uh, this is just an example of something else that one can do. So I've started writing about this and so have other colleagues. So we wrote this paper that was published in Neuron, um, talking about what neuroscientists can do and pretty similar to what I've been telling you in this, in this talk. Um, and this is part of this thing of talking about it. The more we talk about it, the more um, action um, we can elicit from other, other groups. So I think we really are standing at a crossroads. I think we can, um, we can either, as a species, we can either say, well, we've had a nice party, you know, but our, our time is going to be up soon. Um, or we can say we're an intelligent species, we're the most intelligent species that's ever lived. And this is possibly the biggest problem we've ever faced. Um, so, you know, we can deploy our intelligence and try and solve this problem. And I, and I do believe that we have a choice. And I do believe that there's reason for optimism, because I think young people are really coming out and saying, we want to protect the future, we want to have a future. Um, and I think young people are not going to be as stuck in the status quo as, as the kind of older generation are. And I really think that there's the potential for change. Um, and I hope that we can do it. So um, I hope that you will feel optimistic as well and, and help make this happen. So thank you. I will um, stop there and then hand back to the host. Thank you very much, Professor Jeffrey, for the awesome talk. Uh, now straight to the next presentation, which will be a short talk by Professor Tom Burling. 
He's a professor of pathology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Helsinki, but he is also the vice director of a university with topics like campus development and social responsibility in his portfolio, thus being also responsible for the climate actions of the university. And in this latter role of his, he is now going to briefly comment on the topic of our workshop. Professor Berling, uh, thank you for finding the time to uh, attend our workshop and the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Kate. It was really an inspiring uh, talk you, you gave and a lot of, of things to, to think about. Uh, just uh, as was mentioned, I'm professor of pathology, but uh, I have to specify further. I, I, I did a lot of neuropathology, so I feel that I'm among friends in, in, in neuroscience uh, also. But I would like to share just a few slides, but I don't see if I have the possibility to share slides here as a panelist. Uh, at least in my Zoom, there is no share screen. Oh, should have the right. yes, yes. now. And uh, do you see anything now? Yes. And, and you see the slide, I hope, also. <laughs> uh, sustainability at the University of Helsinki. And first of all, I would like to, to, to say that, uh, of course, I, I try to look at sustainability in, in a very broad and holistic uh, view. Uh, and uh, we worked together with the 13 other universities in, in Finland to, together to, to make a an, an, uh, program which we all have uh, signed to, to, to follow. And instead of looking at the SDGs by, by the United Nations, we, we decided to think about sustainability in, in the view of, of how the operations of, of the university, the main thing, research, teaching, uh, so social in, interaction, and then, of course, uh, our own functions and administration. Uh, you can all find these on the, on the net, so I won't read uh, through them, but, but please look at num number seven. All the universities in Finland have a sign that we should follow the principles of carbon neutrality, uh, uh, circular economy, and, and uh, to take concrete measures to foster biodiversity. And I think this is a very important statement. We, we, we decided that this would not be a report, but, but uh, more like a thesis that we, we, we like uh, Luther in his time, we will nail these on, on, the, on the doors of the universities, at least sim in, 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 in symbolical uh, matter. But, but these theses are now taken very seriously and we will have, have uh, follow-up meetings with the universities and, and each and everybody of us are doing a lot. But what are we doing at, at our university? Uh, first of all, uh, I think that we have to think about climate change and, and carbon neutrality always in pair with biodiversity. That, that, is, that is an important thing. Uh, our strategy uh, tells us we have decided that we shall, shall be carbon uh, neutral by 2030. And, and, and that is a rather difficult thing to do especially living in Finland where the houses are cold and we, we use a lot of energy to heat the buildings. Uh, nonetheless, we, we are going to do that and, and we are now doing a roadmap. Uh, it, it's under work. Uh, what are the steps we are going to do uh, during uh, this decade so that we really are carbon neutral in, in 10 years? Uh, a roadmap and a program is it's only words unless we do something and we are doing a lot uh, and, and as uh, previously I think it's very important to remember that that the university can do bigger steps but each and everybody of us can do small steps and, and together we will we'll, we'll do this. What have we been doing? Now, let's say we are now, now dealing with our electricity, electricity and, and, and uh, making deals so that all, all our electricity will be so-called green electricity. Uh, our investments uh, uh, portfolio has changed. So it is completely out of uh, industry with, with uh, fossil, uh, uh, fossil products. Uh, and, 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 and a lot other things and we are, are trying to, to uh, make them more visible so, so that uh, each of, of, of our, our university uh, can, can understand that we take this uh, seriously. 
but of course a university lives within a society we cannot do anything alone and our uh, most important key stakeholder is the city of Helsinki. The city of Helsinki provides us with, uh, with the heat of our buildings. And in fact, 50% of the carbon emissions from, from our university comes from heating our buildings. Uh, the second biggest is, is then travel, uh, commuting to work or, or, or travels uh, abroad. Uh, and, and then all the others are in fact rather small, under 25%. Uh, then, of course, as an organization, I, I would always like to, to emphasize that a that, uh, uh, university in, in daily functions does not, uh, in fact, differ very much from other big organization, let's say a an, an pharmaceutical company or, or an other company. So and in daily functions, I don't think we have to invent something special for the university. But then we come to what what is special with a university. Yes, we do research and we do education and, and using these we can, can really uh, enlarge our handprint to, to make the society to, to, to move towards an, a carbon neutral society. Uh, we have a voice, we have a, a lot of students and, and uh, one, one of the good things I have <laughs> Uh, experience with, with, with the climate change is that, that we really have a common goal, both student and, and, and teacher, uh, a, a common will to, to, to proceed in this. And then, uh, of course, uh, different kind of global actions. Uh, uh, we, we are members of, of, of different uh, alliances. We are active at COP26, which was already mentioned today. And of course, we are discussing with the politicians and, and, and our government how our research, how our education can promote uh, the, the goal of the society. Uh, these were the few words I, I just wanted to share with you before the panel discussion. And, and I. Uh, release the screen by this. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Berling. And like he said, now is uh, time for some discussion. Uh, I think I will now try to first bring this more closer to the everyday work life you know, in the neuroscience labs. And to start off, I would like to ask both you of you, Professor Jeffrey and Professor Berling, a question that we also asked from our attendees in our climate questionnaire. So uh, what do you think are the mo uh, major obstacles in doing more sustainable research and considering uh, the audience maybe especially in the life science field? Maybe you go first, Professor Jeffrey. Yeah, this is a, a good and very, very difficult question. <laughs> um, because, you know, I've thought about this in relation to my own work. So en energy is obviously a big one. So we do use a lot of energy to run the air conditioning plants in our animal house and run our fume cupboards and, and all of that type of stuff. Um, so we're trying to make energy efficiency gains wherever we can and try and switch to renewable energy um, sources. But the other really big problem is consumables. Um, Single-use plastic especially, so we have a bit of a conflict between the health and safety requirements that we wear PPE and all of this kind of stuff, um, and we use a lot of um, plastics, you know, gloves and gowns and, and all of these kinds of things. So we are, we are trying to change. So one of the things that we did recently was to switch away from our single-use um, clothing coverings, the, the Tyvek suits that we, we had. Um, switch back to cotton, which we launder, um, which is kind of more old fashioned and yet seems more kind of, you know, environmentally friendly. There are sort of initiatives. So there's, there's an organization within UCL called LEAF, which is actually trying to advise labs on how to green themselves. And I think it would be good to see more of that type of thing. So that if you are thinking, yeah, maybe I'd like to change, there's a list of practical steps that you can take. But it's a big job. Professor Perling. Yes, I agree with Kate. Uh, laboratories are, 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 are difficult and in, uh, I don't have much more to add about, but what we are thinking of is, is shared economy, 
because uh, I think nowadays we have a lot of labs that are, are used to a very small time of the day and equipment as well. So, so, so collaboration or within the university, but also with other actors. So for instance, at our wiki campus, we are now uh, discussing with the, the uh, other institutions who do research that we could share our, our laboratories, our equipment. And, and that I think is, is uh, a good way to, 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 to function. And, and that needs, of course, actions from, from, from each and everybody to, to accept that somebody else comes to my lab and uses the equipment I have bought. So a trust in each other for, for, the, for the reason of, of the future. Thank you for quick answers. And I will now uh, share the screen for a while to show what our uh, attendees actually answered to this question. So well, maybe I this time press the correct button. <laughs> yeah, I think so. No, nothing happens now. So uh, our attendees said that for them, the most, uh, the, the major obstacles uh, is fear of compromising the quality, so basically probably the health standards and cleanliness that uh, K. Jeffrey uh, Jeffrey mentioned. Uh, but then the next biggest obstacle seems to be lack of know-how. So what actually to do? So maybe not to know what is the next action that you actually could do. And then of course it's the question of funding, so that there isn't uh, enough money to actually uh, start to work towards the things that you. Uh, thing, thing that are important. Uh, just to uh, show and demonstrate the lack of uh, know-how, we also asked from our participants from University of Helsinki whether they know what is the difference between the black and orange garbage bags. So uh, majority of the uh, answer, answer said that they don't know. So even on, on, a, on the level of basic recycling in the labs and even the kitchens, there is no knowledge uh, just to let everyone know, these are, these are the <laughs> official answers. So orange burnable energy waste and black non-burnable mixed waste. Uh, we also asked, let me see. Yeah, another question we would like to ask you is, what do you think should university, universities do? How can they help um, labs to become more sustainable? Maybe Professor Böding can start. <laughs> uh, okay, well, well, uh, improve waste management, yes, of course, and 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 that that we are go going to do. But I'm very happy with this questionnaire because I, I would like to ask to have it, so so that you can use it as a tool. Uh, I was not aware that people are not aware how to, to function in a laboratory, for instance. So, so when we are making the carbon neutrality roadmap, uh, and and the the, the pro project in fact is is uh, chaired by our our laboratory head. So so uh, head of laboratory works in, at the university. So so I think he will be very happy with this. Well, then finance more effectively. Uh, I I don't see what it comes after the F, but yeah, the, the sorry, the slides are not perfect in this sense, but uh, <laughs> it's basically well, more like more financing from the mm. university is something that is, mm. like, yeah, yeah, that, that would be good. Of course, we have to remember that we only have one sack of money, so so we have no extra money to put uh, in, in when, when we are speaking about uh, sustainability. So, for instance, we are going to buy green electricity that will be a bit more expensive in fact so, so the university has to to think where, where can we take the money and the same is, is, is the laboratory but of course the bigger the demand is of uh, environmentally uh, sustainable lab equipment the price will also go down so yes support on on, on how to to do this is, is important of course yeah, one um, answer was also that the university should finance more environmental friendly um, travels, for example, when flying to conferences and so on, that the university would cover the most efficient flight, even if it's, for example, more cost costly instead of just financing the most uh, cheap, like the cheapest flight, which might be has some detours or um, maybe also compensating the, the carbon um, emissions. So that answer, 
present actually chose. Um, yeah, I think that both Kate's uh, university and we have been discussing the ABC, avoid book alternatively and compensate. And of course, the question of compensation is, is, is very difficult. Uh, and 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 uh, we have been thinking about it a lot. Uh, uh, we we compensated all the flights two years ago, but now we are thinking more of of, of the handprint of the university. University. We think that that the money could be used better if if we we use it in 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 in, in research for for sustainability. I don't know how it is in UK, Kate. Do, do you compensate the, the flights? Um, there's been a recent move for funders to um to finance the uh, is it funders or ucl there's been there's certainly been a change where um people are encouraged to take oh i know what it is yeah they've been told that they won't fund ucl won't fund people to fly to somewhere where they could have traveled by train in under some number of hours five hours or something like that so the university has just said you need to spend the extra time and take the more carbon um, we've also talked about trying trying to get funders to um, to fund the difference between the cheapest form of travel and the most efficient carbon efficient form of travel, because it is often more expensive to take the train than to fly. Like like air travel is ridiculously cheap. It's it's really criminally subsidised, and um, so you know. People are financially encouraged to take the, the, the flight. So yeah, so there's talk, but it's really difficult to get people to agree to change because, it, as you say, you know, purse strings are tight and so on, and people don't want to spend unnecessary time or unnecessary money. So it comes back to this thing of people won't do something by and large if it's not going to benefit them directly. So it's difficult. Uh, one thing we have been thinking of is, is also to make it more easy for individual researchers to 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 plan their trips so that it be as 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 carbon neutral as it can be. I mean, take the flight and then the train. If you just ask the travel agency, they will probably give you two, two flights when it could be much much better to to fly to the big center and then take the train. But 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 we have have to have the mindset for, for those who, who produce the, the travel uh, services for us. That, that's an, an issue we are discussing now. I have wondered whether we could do some type of carbon trading. So I know that as a society, we haven't managed to do something like that. But I it just occurred to me to wonder whether as an institution, we could do something. So for example, if a lab takes the more carbon efficient option to get everyone to a conference maybe they can earn some credit for the carbon that they saved mm -hmm. or if they reduce their electricity consumption they can get some credits and then they can use those credits for something mm -hmm. um turn it back into money for mm -hmm. make it if you make it if you reward people for doing what it is you need them to do then they will do it mm -hmm. true thanks both there are a couple of questions and comments in the qa so let's have one of those uh, let's start with this one. So political actions are also influenced by the industry, which is profiting a lot from the current situation. How would you convince those parties that seemingly can only lose by accepting a more sustainable way? Maybe Professor Jeffrey <laughs> likes to go first. So I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understood. How, how could we convince corporations not to... I, I assume so. So how to basically talk big uh companies and industry that are profiting from their current say carbon emissions and so on so yeah I, them into being more sustainable I this think. is what government's for i think <laughs> um well i mean so individuals we could do things like boycott companies um and there there is a little bit of that but ultimately people will use the products from those companies if it's if it makes life easier for themselves so um really the only way that you could really get them to change is for us to make things illegal or, or to charge tax things really heavily uh, for that you need government to step in i think and, and say you know if, if you're going to do this we're going to tax you um hugely on the other hand you know if you switch to something more carbon friendly then we'll give you a tax rebate or, or something like that so i i see that's where 
um, the authorities and, and the social structures have to play a part. Yeah, I could just add that, of course, uh, in, in choosing the partners, the universities can do something. I mean, decide from whom we buy uh, supplies and, and uh, let's say our restaurant services and, and, and so on. And, and that, that is already in process in, in, in some, of, some of our acquisitions at the university. We have another question um, about how to talk to denialists. So if it's not helpful to talk with them about facts, what you, should you do instead? Should you, wait, should, should you speak to them individually or in groups of people? Maybe also Dr. Professor Jeffrey could answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, my feeling is if, if somebody is a denialist, you're not going to change their mind by talking to them. <laughs> I, I think the best thing you can do is to appreciate and understand their position. And, and, you know, just empathize, just say, you know, I, I don't agree, but I, I see where you're coming from. Um, because the only way to win people over is for them to um, come to trust you and, and admit you into their network of people they trust and, and, and want to emulate. And that doesn't happen overnight. So, so I, I would just say, don't waste your time trying to convert a denialist. Just say, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate your view and, and you will have to agree to differ. Um, would you like some cake? You know, <laughs> you're a nice person um, and, and leave it for another time. And, and you know, it may take a long time. You know, if you've got a friend who's a denialist or something like that, it may take a long time, but um, you know, work, you, you should spend your energy where it's most likely to have an effect. For example, people who don't know yet, like school children, you know, or, or people who never really thought about it, um, or people who are on the fence, those people where you might have an effect, that's where you should spend your energy. We are already running over time, so maybe I will uh, start closing this session, but maybe like a very short, encouraging like bottom line thing, what you want to say to our audience on this theme, how, how to go forward and save our planet, basically. Buy the lab. <laughs> <laughs> who, who goes first? Sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, encouraging words. I think, I think we can solve this. And I see encouraging signs that, that the planet is starting to wake up to the scale of the problem. Um, and I think once, um, once we have, we do have an incredible amount of collective intelligence. Um, and I do think that we can, we, we can make a difference. And I, and I think that the way to do it is going to be by working together and you know, um, trying to uh, work cooperatively rather than competitively and just recognize that we're all in this together, I guess. So I'm an optimist. <laughs> well, well, uh, difficult to say. We are uh, thinking of the same same word, collaboration together. Uh, this this is a matter for for students, for for those who work here and 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 and, and or alumni. So 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 the common force to 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 to, to go forward is is the, the important thing. And 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 then I would like to have we have we had a very good uh, uh, event at the university for the leadership speaking about climate change and and, and had a speech and, and ended ended with with uh, thinking uh, thinking uh, toivon the hope is there so 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 if we claim that it's we don't cannot do anything then people won't do it so we have to keep the faith in in, in that this, this is possible all the time and that's i think the role for the leadership especially much yes Thank you. Thank you very much both for, for, for both of you, Professor Jeffrey and Professor Berling, for your time and for your contribution. Let's hope Thank that you have stirred some thoughts in our audience and that we can see some uh, future action also uh, stemming from all of us. And uh, as, as Professor Berling wished, I think we can make the uh, questionnaire results available both of you, to both of you and then the attendees afterwards, of course, Thank naturally. You. Our program continues with poster session at three, so in five minutes or so, and then the last symposium session of the day will start at quarter past four, so see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you, Kate.